Good morning. I'm Patrick Cronin, the director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. And we are delighted to have a panel that's going to focus on creating new mechanisms, political, military engagement, and other mechanisms for trying to reduce or manage risk in the maritime space in East Asia, especially in the East and the South China Seas. And we have three presenters who will each speak for just 10 minutes, um, one from Canada, one from Japan, and one from Taiwan. And then we have two distinguished American discussants to kind of bring this back to U.S. and Alliance uh, perspectives uh, on these issues. But I want to begin with Dr. James Manicom, who's Research Fellow for Global Security at the Center for International Governance Innovation, He's just flown in from Canada, and uh, as the father of a young child, uh, he's not getting much sleep these days, but we are <laughs> delighted he's here because he has great expertise on these issues. So James, over to you. Thanks, uh, and thank you uh, for having me uh, and for accommodating my, um, my in and out travel mm. schedule that comes with, uh, with having to bargain to leave the house these days uh, with my wife. Uh, so I thought I would start with um, just a blanket statement relating to the, this, the topic of the day, which is, you know, uh, Dr. Self talked about really tangible, concrete ways forward. Is that I, and I, I'm increasingly of the, the view that move the other mic away. Just it's a little feedback. That we have, I think we know what we need to do when it comes to confidence building. We know what kind of steps you can take to make the ocean safer. Rules of the road and 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 the CNO. I think it was the CNO uh, said about a week ago or two weeks ago that that you know there really wasn't a need for an inksy with China because everything you have in the coal regs and all the rules of the road is, is, is that you should be able to drive your ships around safely with what we've got. So this is about can countries follow the rules? Do they want to follow the rules that we have? Uh, and are they capable of following the rules that we have? Uh, Canada is not a terribly present country in East Asia, but we are in the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, uh, where last year they did agree on a code for unalerted encounters at sea called the Qs, um, and apparently it was an Australian initiative. At the last minute, the Chinese, which is the Navy that everyone's sort of worried about bumping into, um, uh, pulled out of it. And the question is, well, why did they pull out of this voluntary mechanism about, about you know, how to interact when you come across a ship that you either weren't expecting or, or wasn't following the rules? Um, and so that raises the issue, what, what if the Chinese Navy isn't, isn't capable enough, I don't know if that's the right word, um, of following the rules, or what if the, you know, not the Cambodian Navy or other navies in the region aren't able to follow the rules. So I just want to just, that's where my thinking is at, is that it, it's a question of now of political will in some cases and of capacity in others. But as to the broader issue of East and South China Seas, I thought I'd make three quick points about ways forward and try to uh, discuss these and, and then throw a bit of complexity into, into what might otherwise be relatively simple propositions. So, I mean, the first thing we could do is try to solve these disputes either by arbitration or through a negotiated settlement like the Australians and these team Marines did. did. Um, there are a number of barriers to that, which we heard about uh, from the ambassador, right, including the fact that diplomacy is now uh, uh, a subject or beholden to domestic political, uh, political attitudes, right? And so countries, governments perceive domestic costs to, to arbitration, right? Uh, and there's also arguably strategic costs, depending on, on who you are and where you sit in, the, in, in a given government, you may perceive strategic costs to losing uh, control of the sea or the ability to control the sea uh, uh, in the region. I think that economic costs associated with arbitration, by the way, could be easily mitigated because you can, you can share um, most things that are of economic value. Um, arbitration is also unlikely because it is potentially precedent setting, right? We hear this from the Japanese side all the time that the Japanese won't arbitrate case A because they worry about uh, having to be forced to arbitrate cases B and C. Uh, likewise, we, although if careful reading, I think, of Japanese policies, just they might, you know, let's say, since they speak to this or not, but they might not be uh, that, that opposed to arbitrating uh, Senkaku if, if it was done in the right way, that, you know, if China brought it up. Of course, problematic from China's point of view, they don't recognize the ICJ, and they've opted out of all the relevant unclosed dispute uh, resolution mechanisms as they relate to sovereignty and historic waters. One ink wrinkle, though, that, that does um, present itself when you think about arbitration or settlement is that arbitration creates a loser, right? You get a winner and a loser, uh, and that's not always a good thing. Uh, particularly when you have a history that is as fraught with winning and losing as the Sino-Japanese history is, right? So we got to think about whether or not arbitration is actually in the international interest. Also, arbitration doesn't always solve the problem, right? Malaysia and Indonesia arbitrated uh, their, merit, their territorial dispute and then promptly engaged in a bit of a naval confrontation in the sea areas that surround it, right? Thailand and Cambodia also arbitrated 
arbitrated the Prey of Ahir case, and they're the last two Asian countries to actually shoot each other uh, just last year. So arbitration doesn't always solve the problem. It's not a silver bullet. So if you accept that arbitration is either unwieldy or, or politically impossible, how do you build the political will to at least get along uh, at sea or in also generally? Well, one attitude is to uh, pursue true God's honest historical reconciliation in East Asia. Right, which seems like a pipe dream, but you do hear it from time to time from various political leaders, uh, most recently, I think, the Korean president. Right? In this view, the Chinese people would presumably choose to forgive and forget uh, about, about uh, the Second World War. The Chinese government would find a, a different legitimizing mechanism uh, uh, to demonize, perhaps not Japan. Perhaps they would start demonizing America more uh, instead of Japan, and they would get along. Um, Japan, presumably, the Japanese people um, would, would would be, would be perhaps less motivated by conservatives that insist visiting on Yasukuni, um, and perhaps the Japanese government would, would irrevocably endorse the Moriyama apology or something, right? You wouldn't have this ambiguity as to, well, what does the prime minister believe or not believe? Um, in this view, China would also adopt a more realistic attitude towards what historical claims are in the South China Sea, right? Um, historic rights is very, is very hard to prove, even if you can uh, prove it uh, over ocean waters at all, right? Um, because you assume that other people recognize your, 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 your exercising jurisdiction in those waters at a time before um, maritime jurisdiction even really existed. Um, and this is, of course, unlikely because it's not clear that China is capable of any of this. Um, notions of the century of humiliation are embedded in its national psyche. Um, as relates to the term great powers, right? They talk about major power relations because, of course, a great power in the Chinese lexicon is a country that invaded China and imposed the century, the, the century of humiliation, right? And of course, sovereignty is another question. I was at the Shanghai Institute of International Studies uh, last week, where we, um, uh, as dutiful Canadians, were trying to propose a Track 2 dialogue where we talk about sovereignty. And I said, you know, we're probably just going to divide Hans Island with Denmark right in half. I mean, that's probably what we're going to do, and, and we don't care. And they said, we don't have a word for that. Sovereignty in China means, you, in Chinese, I don't speak Chinese very well, but it can't be divided. You can divide the rights around it, but you can't divide an island in half if the, China has sovereignty over that island in the Chinese language. That was a little sobering. Another, alter, another alternative is you could try to build empathy with one another, try to build trust. Um, you could do this via a critical oral history project. This also does happen, right? If you've seen that picture of Fidel Castro and, um, and Robert McNamara embracing, right, there was an effort to get retired officials together to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, which at least amongst those gentlemen uh, did a lot to, uh, to improve their, their relationship. And I don't know what effect it's had on the Cuban-U.S. relationship, but there, is, it, there are different mechanisms you can use uh, between scholars at the track to level to try to build trust and empathy with one another. Um, interestingly, this sounds, this sounds far-fetched, but this is increasingly a refrain you hear from the non-experts. Gideon Rockman uh, had a, a, an op-ed in the FT just the other day where he talks about China and Japan recognizing the legitimacy of one of those concerns, which I think is something that perhaps the experts in the field of have gotten away from as even being a, a realistic possibility because we're so well versed in, in just how visceral some of the, of the distrust is on both sides. So this leaves us with a third option, which is just to continue to muddle through, right? And muddling through has a wide variety of different of features. We could um, negotiate a new status quo around the Senkaku Jiayu Islands, right? This would be one that would tolerate per, uh, periodic intervention by China as they are doing right now with the Coast Guard vessels. You'd have managed restraint on both sides, which you're having right now. Although it's not clear that the Japanese government's thrilled about this, and, and most Japanese um, scholars and policymakers that I've heard speak recently uh, suggest that they are not happy with this. This is not something they view to be sustainable. Also, it's also not clear that China views the current status quo to be the status quo, because you have small little, little efforts to change what is normal around the islands, right, with the drone flights, and there's this rumor of them extending their air defense identification zone. Um, you could reduce chances of escalation by developing very clear protocols between their Coast Guards. I think the Coast Guards, as far as I heard, I've heard, are, don't speak to each other, but they're, everyone's acting with restraint. Um, you could agree on corridors or codes of conduct as relate to Chinese vessels heading out to the Pacific. The Japanese government accepts that Chinese naval ships have to go by Japan to get to the Pacific, uh, but they could do it in a way that is perhaps a little bit less provocative, um, and there could be a, a, a better interaction between helicopters and destroyers and those kinds of things. But the governments recognize this because there have been talks, right? Those talks on on, on Congress building are, are hamstrung to political prerogatives. Um, and of course, the third part of this is, is, um, is clear U.S. statements uh, to both Beijing and Tokyo about what its role is in the Senkaku Jiayu Islands. It might be interesting for the United States, and I'm sure the United States is doing this, or someone somewhere in this government is doing this, to think about what the U.S. Uh, responsibility is in an East China Sea scenario, right? What happens if a, if a Japanese Coast Guard ship is driving around the 
Chen Shao Shurik have a gas field and it's it's buzzed or bumped into by a Chinese Coast Guard? What what, what are the um, what are the escalation uh, issues that surround that as related to the alliance? I'm not sure if perhaps if ambiguity or, or, or clarity is a better course of action there. Uh, the third point, and this is my final point to lend on this, is you could pursue trade-offs. And this is an argument I make in, in a very small book I've written about the East China Sea, is you, you could engage in, in, in trade-offs between the two countries' interests in the area. Um, Japan, as far as I understand, has no real interest in the resource development of the East China Sea, because the area that is next to Japan is deep, uh, and there might not be much there, right? It's a universal law of geology that the farther offshore you get, the less likely you are to find anything of value. Whereas China is, where the, so even if you didn't, if you solved the limitation question, the Japanese area probably wouldn't be that perspective for natural gas anyway. Minerals is a different question. But Japan could exchange that, or could trade that, for some kind of binding uh, um, uh, set of arrangements on the conduct of Chinese vessels at sea, right? Um, I'm actually fairly optimistic about their ability to manage the Senkaku Islands dispute because they have already been restraining their nationalist groups, uh, the non-government nationalist groups, from, 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 from getting to the islands. The question is, what happens when you get your next Ishihara, who, uh, whose objective it is, is to derail the relationship? And that is certainly an area where, uh, as the ambassador talked about, uh, deeper ties between the leadership uh, is what's necessary. The problem there is it's not always clear just uh, how much responsibility the, the Chinese, the Politburo Standing Committee, takes with foreign policy, and I'll leave it there. Dr. Manicom, thank you very much. Innovative, creative, uh, and uh, outside uh, ideas, very helpful. I want to turn now to Dr. Yoshihide Soya, who is one of the great sort of contributors in um, Japan these last few years in particular to thinking about Japan's future and evolving security role, and we're very fortunate that he's in town as a Japan fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. So if your microphone is on, the floor is yes. yours. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, James uh, is making a day trip, I understand, from Toronto. And, uh, I was locally recruited, and uh, I was lucky to be here. And Patrick was, uh, what, uh, attentive enough to find me out. I was trying to hide myself uh, uh, <laughs> to concentrate on my sabbatical uh, uh, project. But uh, in Washington, that's impossible. I, yeah. Well. Uh, Thank you, and uh, indeed, it's my privilege uh, to be invited here and to talk about this terribly difficult uh, but important uh, issue. Uh, personally, I'm not that optimistic uh, uh, regarding the possibility of uh, China-Japan reaching a so-called solution uh, on this issue, not only in the immediate future, but, but maybe almost forever. Uh, but I, I'm a bit optimistic uh, uh, in the sense that we will eventually find ways to uh, continue to live with it, uh, uh, except that uh, or unless uh, th there are sort of uh, un sort of intended uh, kind of outcomes, results out of uh, whatever I mean, miscalculations or or, you know, uh, unnecessary local provocations and, and so forth. So all the more, I think, uh, establishing a sort of uh, kind of confidence building measures or uh, let alone, I mean, a hotline, establishing the hotlines between the two militaries uh, and so forth. Those measures would be, I think, uh, re realistically speaking, uh, what are needed uh, very much in, in, in the near future. But having said that, uh, uh, let me, as a scholar, uh, present my personal view on why uh, the issue is innately difficult. Uh, this has to do with, uh, I think, two basic trends uh, which are simultaneously evolving uh, out of the rise of China. Uh, first uh, aspect of the rise of China uh, is Today's uh, spectacular success of Chinese modernization programs, I think, is a result of, uh, not to mention Deng Xiaoping's very courageous decisions back in the late 1970s, the result of China getting into a established so-called liberal international order, which is the creation of advanced uh, democracies and economies. Uh, US, Europe, and Japan joined this group. Uh, in the 1960s. And so uh, it, was, it was very symbolic. Deng Xiaoping chose Japan 
as the first country to visit after he started very you know, uh, kind of courageous open door and reform policies. And so Japan was naturally the country which China wanted badly uh, in, in starting uh, modernization programs. And Japan's policy has long been to help China modernize with a slogan. I think this was more than a slogan. Uh, uh, our, our policy was uh, uh, kind of propagated to the Japanese public as well as to the, to the world uh, by saying that economically developed China and the stable, so societally stable China uh, and politically stable China is good for Sino-Japanese relations as well as for the region and the world. And uh, so that's how we started to give massive ODA to China. And Japan was the first country, of Japanese companies were the first you know, group of uh, 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 corporations starting foreign direct investment in China. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm not saying this uh, uh, simply to sell Japan, but just, just to uh, remind us of the fact that China in the liberal international order used to be the key to Chinese success and will continue to be the key for China to continue to develop economically and deal with associated problems uh, uh, coming from its uh, uh, rapid changes. But the second aspect of the rise of China, this has to do with the territorial disputes. As a result of China bec becoming you know, confident in its rise and becoming a great power, I think uh, somewhat, uh, 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 I, I, I don't want to use the term middle kingdom mentality explicitly, but something resembling that I think is being revived in the minds of chi Chinese people. And uh, so I think that resulted in very typically uh, Xi Jinping's argument of uh, a new type of uh, great power relationship between US and China. And uh, so in that sense, they are saying our preferences, interests should be respected. And, and I think by extension, that would mean for us living in the neighborhood of China, that Asia with China at the center uh, should be the natural sort of uh, you know, uh, Asia, uh, which, which, has been, which used to be the case a long time ago. And I think this, this point is very much explicit in Chinese argument that disputed territories and waters uh, have been Chinese since ancient times. So, so these were Chinese since ancient times, therefore, uh, with a reason China, uh, those Chinese claims uh, should be respected. I think that's, that's very much deep in, in Chinese uh, kind of psyche, uh, if you will, uh, in, in, uh, explicit in their territorial disputes. And the Japanese position, I, I don't think I need to repeat this, uh, and of course, it's not my intention to, to sell uh, the, the, this position uh, from a personal point of view, but uh, our position has been that Senkaku Islands were included in Japan in January 1895, and then came the Shimonoseki Treaty to end the first Sino-Japanese War in April 1989, uh, so, so, sorry, uh, 1895. So there are four months difference. That's, that's very important from our point of view. And, uh, and uh, well, the Japanese major government decision to include Senkaku in January 1895 clearly had to do with their prospect of colonizing Taiwan as the war uh, was reaching a conclusion. And so from their point of view, there is no big difference between January and, 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 and May uh, of the same year. But from Japanese point of view, uh, these are very important, the difference is very important from modern international law perspective. So they are different entities. And uh, so legally speaking, if they are different or not, I think that's, that's a very critical issue. But uh, in the modern history of uh, kind of Meiji Japan's sort of, you know, uh, expansion. Uh, that process, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of detailed, but uh, that difference is important. Therefore, in the Shimonoseki Treaty, Senkaku was not mentioned uh, when Japan colonized Taiwan. And uh, so from there until today, Japan has been controlling Senkaku effectively. That's been our position, including about 25 years when U.S. controlled Senkaku as part of Okinawa. 
and uh, and so so here I, I I'm not raising these two points, uh, uh, trying to suggest which which is a stronger case, but here the fundamental difference is Chinese arguments rest on their belief that. Chinese, you know, the fact that this has been there since ancient times should be respected under the current circumstances. But Japanese position, I think, it rests on the kind of kind of uh, the kind of legal legal point of view in the modern history of international relations uh, when Westphalian system uh, expanded into Asia. So, so this this I think this there is a clash of paradigm here. Kind of China center, legitimacy of the traditional China centered Asia, which for many Chinese is a natural thing, and the legitimacy of what happened in the modern history of international relations in this part of, or in that Asian, you know, East Asia part. And, uh, and another big difference here is uh, what, how you look at history between Japan and China. For, for China, modern history since the Opium War is, is a uh, history of humiliation. That's how they are taught, and how, how, that's how they feel. And of course, Sino-Japanese War, first Sino-Japanese War, is part of those you know, series of wars which humiliated China. So, but for Japan, first Sino-Japanese War was a normal war under you know, the circumstances of those years. Japanese aggression to China in the 1930s, that's obvious aggression, no question about that. If you don't call that an aggression, there will be no aggression in the history of humankind. And, uh, but the first Sino-Japanese war, whether that's a war of aggression or just a normal war and uh, you know, any in international kind of standard, I think at least this could be debatable. But for us, that's a normal war. And uh, so, so those are the differences. You know, and uh, and the, the, here is innately classical paradigm. So I think that's why this is very difficult uh, to solve. And uh, in, in the modern aspect of uh, the past development, uh, th there is a question of shelving the issue. And, and again, to just explain the Japanese case, uh, it was uh, December 1971, uh, which Chinese Foreign Ministry started to claim this for the first time. But Taiwan started to make the argument a few years before that. So perhaps Beijing's action was in response to Taiwan's move, uh, uh, perhaps. And, uh, but anyway, uh, that was the very first time when Beijing started to argue, uh, make the case. And that was in the process of diplomatic normalization between Tokyo and Beijing. And so December 71, Chinese Foreign Ministry claimed officially for the first time. And sometime in the spring of uh, 72, Apparently, in the preparatory work toward normalization, which happened in September 1972, uh, there, there is a foreign ministry document uh, which talks about issues uh, in relation to normalization. And one of the issues was clearly the Senkaku issue. And already in that document, I wrote about this in, in, the, in the book on Sino-Japanese relations, which I co-authored with three other scholars, which will come out next month. But, but in Japanese, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so I, I took hold of that document just recently, and I was surprised that uh, in that document, it was clearly stated that there, there is no dispute on, on this issue. It's natural, because China started to argue just a, you know, December 71, and the Japanese government uh, talking about this issue, uh, how to deal with it. And so, so it clearly says this, there should be no dispute. That's been our position. And that position was very firm from the very beginning, as far as our government was concerned. And again, it's not surprising, given the backgrounds uh, of, of this. And, uh, but Japanese approach since then, th there should be no big difference for, for many, but that's OK. But uh, shelving, there was no clear case where Japan agreed to shelve. Or, for, for instance, Prime Minister Tanaka talking to uh, Premier Zhao Enlai. But Chinese are saying that was an agreement to shelf. But uh, given this you know, government position that I just talked about, uh, it's uh, unimaginable that the government would have said, we agree to shelf. But I, I tend to explain this as Japan trying to put it aside. 
I don't know whether there is difference <laughs> between <laughs> shelving it or putting it aside. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but Japan clearly you know, uh, continued to put it aside in order to advance relations with China, in, in order for this issue not to become an obstacle in developing relations with China. Okay. There was clearly this you know, attitude of putting this aside. And I think that's been our position, very constant. So future, if I may, one minute or two, Just sorry. One more minute, you should Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. Uh, the the f future possibilities. If we can put you know, the case to just agreeing to put it aside, I think that's no big change uh, as far as Japan's position is concerned. But how to do that? And w one thing is, uh, well, ICJ is often talked about. Okay, my personal view is Japan perhaps can say, you know, uh, there is no dispute about our you know, sovereignty issue, but if China wants to take it to ICJ, we will agree. I think we can go as far as that. And this is not conceding our position, but agreeing indirectly that there is a problem and, uh, and for, for Japan and China to do to, to with it. And the other approach could be multilateralize this issue. And this is another action to say there is a problem, but we want to solve this problem under, under multilateral settings in one way or another. Uh, but of course, uh, for China, this will be not easy to take. But, but the, 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 there should be at least those kind of approaches coming from the Japanese government. That's my personal sort of view uh, as, as one individual Japanese. Dr. Thank Soria, you. thank you yeah. very much for that very thoughtful, unemotional, set of remarks. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Chungli Li, um, is not going to speak for all of China, even though we have a one China policy. But um, one of the views that we don't hear very often on these disputes is from the Taiwan perspective. So uh, I've known uh, Dr. Li for some time, um, and she's been able to articulate, I think, very well some of Taiwan's concerns and approaches to uh, looking for peace, but also how to resolve a dispute. So Dr. Li, over to you. Do have to uh, thanks for this very important and meaningful uh, invitation uh, for me to be here. I my understanding of the purpose of this meeting is to uh, explore the uh, possibility or the measures for risk reductions uh, of maritime uh, insecurity here, uh, maritime security here. So I'm going to uh, focus on that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the sources of, uh, of maritime insecurity. Instead, I will just focus on more constructive way of thinking about the uh, future here. Okay. And uh, my text is, as uh, Patrick just mentioned, uh, is to bring up your uh, attention to Taiwan's case, Taiwan's approach to, uh, to uh, uh, recent responses here. Um, why we should be uh, pay attention to Taiwan's uh, case here? Okay, I think uh, Taiwan is uh, one of the claimants to uh, in the territorial disputes in South China Sea and East China Sea as well. I believe all of you here are familiar with that. However, I want to highlight a few things here. First, Taiwan is uh, uh, is the claimant. Uh, effectively occupy the largest island in the South China Sea. Okay. So as you know, as there are many, many small islands, but you know, Taiping Island is the largest one, and Taiwan is effectively occupied uh, there. Okay. And uh, secondly, in terms of uh, Diao Yu Tai Islands, Senkaku Islands, Taiwan is located to, uh, the location of Taiwan is the closest to Diao Yu Tai Island uh, compared to China and Japan. So if you have map, so in other words, it's not just uh, Taiwan, it's not just uh, one of the claimants, but also a very important uh, security stakeholders in all the pictures here. Okay. And the third feature for Taiwan's case to be interesting is that uh, Taiwan has no or uh, limited, if, if it's not no, limited access to international tools or international mechanisms for uh, maximize our uh, claim, our uh, interests in these territorial disputes, including we don't have access to international law. So uh, what we have discussed in last uh, panel uh, seems 
not available. The international law approach is not available for Taiwan. So thinking about uh, a, a country, a, 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 a player like this, have the largest uh, island and closest to uh, location to, to uh, Diao Yita Island, and also uh, without any international access um, to any conflict prevention measures. Um, uh, such a player, how can we uh, claim our interests and how can we maximize uh, our efforts to keep the stability uh, in this region here. Okay. So um, I just want to highlight three points that, that uh, what, uh, what Taiwan government, Taiwanese government has done uh, in the past regarding to territorial disputes in South China Sea and the East China Sea here. First thing is in 1999 to 2000, Taiwan unilaterally uh, offered confidence building measures in South China Sea by replacing uh, Marines with our Coast Guard okay, uh, in Taiping Island, on Taiping Island. In other words, we focus more on law enforcement measures rather than on military measures to uh, exercise our sovereignty over Taiping Island. Okay. And why so? Because a lot of incidents at sea uh, involve non-military personnel. So we figure out probably police or uh, uh, Coast Guard will play a better role, uh, reduce the risk of uh, um, escalating tensions or misunderstandings there. That's why we replace a uh, Marine uh, with uh, Coast Guard hit there. Until now, still remain the same. We are still having Coast Guard on Taiping Island rather than uh, uh, using all the military approach sending um, troops or navies over there. Okay. Secondly, uh, in terms of uh, uh, well heating the uh, tension between China and, uh, and Japan in, in East China Sea here, okay. last year, October, uh, August, August 5th, uh, 2012, our government uh, kind of proposed the so-called East China Sea Peace Initiative. Okay. In other words, uh, I, I also echo uh, James, the first speaker, uh, saying that uh, in the view of Chinese, uh, um, I mean, Chinese perspective on sovereignty issues, sovereignty is indivisible and compromises. However, from Taiwan's government perspective, the resources can be shared. Okay. In other words, we, we still claim our sovereignty, but we, can, we are willing to share the uh, maritime resources uh, with uh, others. Okay. Basically on that, the, uh, the government proposed East China Sea Peace Initiative here. There are few principles here that followed by a guideline, but I, I don't think a uh, guideline uh, is, is important here, but I, want, I just want to emphasize the, the, the principle of the initiative here. First, to replace or refrain uh, confrontational uh, I mean con confrontational responses to tension with more dialogues. Okay, so the, the, this is show the political willingness to kind of uh, hold back uh, more confrontational gestures there. Secondly, okay, to shelf <laughs> or put away territorial disputes, but uh, to generate more negotiations here. And third, we hope that there is a, a way that we can formulate a code of conduct in uh, East China Sea as well. And then the next stage is joint development of resources. This is the Taiwanese government's position here. I mean, this is the content of uh, East China Sea Peace Initiative. So in this uh, initiative, from the very beginning, to show the political will, to put aside uh, territorial disputes, and then move on to a joint development uh, efforts on these uh, maritime resources here. As, of course, some criticize that uh, this, this initiative is very uh, rhetoric, uh, meaningless. However, uh, immediately we, we got a case to prove that there is a substance for this uh, initiative here. That, that is uh, the fishery agreement signed between Japan and Taiwan. Okay. That the, the fishery agreement has been negotiated for like 17 years long time, okay, and, and until this year, April 10th, uh, the, the, the agreement has been signed, okay, 
and uh, um, the the agreement was signed under in accordance with international law uh, standards, of course. And because I, 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 the in the first panel we also heard that there is a pro provisional uh, provisional arrangement. Uh, before that, uh, the 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 uh, there is a resolution of disputes came out. So uh, this is based on that. Both party, Japanese government and Taiwanese government, agree that we will set up a designate zone for fishermen uh, of both sides to to uh, conduct their 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 I mean living I mean <laughs> to make their living without uh, any fears of uh, violating the law of other countries okay or the other parts okay so in the end I think uh, what Taiwanese government and Japanese government cares about the fishermen's welfare okay in the past a lot of incidents at sea uh, happened because uh, because the the fishermen's uh, they they are they were not aware of uh, the respective law enforcement there. That's why uh, there are a lot of misperceptions and incidents there. So we design design designate a zone that uh, in that zone both sides, uh, both fishermen from both sides can have uh, 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 conduct their fishing. I mean fishing activities and they are freely without uh, being. Um, worry about uh, being captured by the other side, okay? And then set up a Taiwan-Japan uh, fishery committee. That committee was set up uh, one month later after the, the agreement signed, okay? For this committee, they will uh, work on future cooperations, okay? For spatial, uh, spatial, uh, they have a, or, or another area called spatial cooperation area. Okay. So they will work on and explore the possibilities and opportunities for uh, bilateral cooperations there. Okay. That's for the future. Okay. So, uh, but at the same time, we don't mention about uh, sovereignty uh, disputes or sovereignty issues. We just kind of shift, put away uh, the sovereignty issues there. Okay. So because of that, um, we show that uh, fishery agreement can be one of the tools to really uh, put in the substance as for, for our uh, uh, just East China Sea Peace Initiative there, okay? And um, the case also, we also apply the same, same measures in uh, Philippines and Taiwan's case. Also we, we are uh, the, now both sides, we are uh, conducting fishery agreements um, as well, I mean negotiation of fishery agreements. And uh, uh, this year there are some progress already that we agreed to set up hard lines to immediately report any incidents and to, to, uh, to agree that there's no use of force in any circumstances. And then also uh, set up a working group to uh, explore the opportunity for future uh, fishery cooperations. Okay. So I just want to briefly uh, introduce uh, or bring your attention to Taiwan's approach to this maritime security here. Just uh, as a reference point, you know, before we reach to use uh, international law approach to really uh, resolve the disputes. Probably in the middle, in the process, we need something to, uh, to manage or to reduce the uh, risk of uh, maritime security here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The use of force came about as a result of the fishermen yes. incident with the yes. Coast Guard yes. where there was the, yes. the fatality. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Sheila Smith is one of the great experts on uh, Japan and U.S.-Japan alliance relations, and I know she has her own set of comments that she wants to make, but I will also mm -hmm. add to her list the fact that um, yesterday, when National Security Advisor Susan Rice spoke about the commitment of the second term to the rebalancing to Asia policy, she emphasized maritime tensions, and in the questions and answers, she seemed to equate China and Japan as equally likely to escalate tensions, which looks like the United States is just an outside third party, not an ally of Japan. <laughs> Um, and it's very difficult because clearly the United States has got a strong interest in building a, a better, stronger relationship with China. She talked about operationalizing this 
China-U.S. relationship, but it looks like it accepts the Chinese narrative. Anyway, if you have any thoughts about <laughs> that on top of the maritime disputes, that would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you, Patrick. I'm delighted to be here and, and congratulate you and CNAS on, on a terrific project. I came in at the very last part of the previous panel, so I could, could hear a little bit of the, the topics you were discussing. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I had last year spent a little bit of time thinking about exactly where Patrick was asking me to focus, which is what the U.S. policy response should be. Uh, should there be more tensions and a clash in the East China Sea between Japan and China? And just anecdotally, I started off thinking about this, of course, in August and September when the activities in the region were getting very tense, clearly. Um, I wrote a draft of that paper uh, after a discussion in October. I wrote a draft in November. I had to rewrite the draft in December um, because the, the situation was still moving. And I think the U.S. policy community, I suspect the policy community in Japan and China both, were actually taken aback by the pace and the alacrity, I think, by which the two countries really found themselves on the verge of a military, not, if not confrontation, at least interaction, that I think neither country wanted uh, or had anticipated. So I think we should take this, that that was a very interesting moment for me to take a little peek inside the U.S. policymaking process and thinking. And so the, the result of that and my own thoughts are on a, a publication on the CFR website. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But let me back up a little bit on this broader topic of Asia-Pacific maritime stability and risk reduction. Um, from that and this, throughout this whole year, there's been a fairly good conversation, I think, in Tokyo and certainly with us here in Washington, about the fact that we need a menu of options. And I think it was very striking in the previous panel, um, there, was a, there was a focus on the legal opportunities, the ICJ, the UNCLOS, right? Um, but I think it's also important for us to remember that for decades, Japan and China very successfully managed this dispute. And so when we think about maritime risk reduction, I think it's always useful to separate out, and I think Dr. Lee did that at the end of her presentation. Are we trying to manage the problem or do we want to resolve the sovereignty, the underlying sovereignty question? And I think that leads us in different directions. But I think what the region has learned, not only from the South China Sea experience, and particularly the, the Philippine experience of late, but also the Japan-China experience, is we need a lot of options on that menu, right? And they're not mutually exclusive. It doesn't mean if you, ha you can have a political dialogue and, I think as the Philippines rightly are demonstrating, and explore international arbitration. Right? You can have a fairly good allied conversation on crisis management and still have engagement and outreach with Beijing. So I think that the, the, the real lesson here is it's not either or, but we ought to be creating these menus and exploring the latitude of some of these menus. And I think because the Asia Pacific has not had uh, really robust mechanisms for talking about these problems, we, we, we get a little paralyzed in our thinking of either or. And, and I think it's, it's, it's very useful to expand that a little bit. Um, on the managing, I think Soya Sensei um, reminded us, I think, of the history of this relationship, not only Japan's position, but the history of the bilateral management of it. And I think it's equally important as we go back and look at the 78 Treaty and the preparatory remarks and who said what, it's equally important to look at the, the three decades afterwards where there was a very successful effort by uh, Chinese and Japanese governments. Um, I was at a conference in Seoul last week with Europeans who had worked on the Nordic Agreement, for example. On um, There was a Greek uh, former foreign minister who wanted to talk about the Aegean Sea. Right? There's example and opportunity, I think, for this to be a comparative project as well, and I, I, I urge you in that direction. It was very interesting. But I think, again, Dr. Lee was emphasizing there's a lot of options here on the management side. We don't have to get ourselves trapped by the sovereignty piece of the puzzle. Um, now, on the Asia-Pacific piece, the other thing I'm learning, and I think it's probably wise in the discussion, perhaps we can talk about this further, is we talk about the Asia-Pacific as if East China Sea and South China Sea are the same. And I don't think they are, but it's worth having a conversation about whether they are or not. Um, I think in terms of causes, um, I was very struck. We did a web page at CFR on maritime issues, China's rise, right, and maritime issues. And uh, Chen Dingli from Fudan, who all of you probably know is a very uh, great scholar of regional relations, he said they're different from China's perspective, right? South China Sea is about energy, resources, and China's growth. East China Sea is about history, right? So I don't think we should be trapped in that distinction, but I think we should explore the question of do we have mechanisms that work in both regions? Perhaps we need to think of differences in mechanisms. They're not both the same. Um, 
one piece of the puzzle on that, and I'll move off to Patrick Try in one minute to answer your question about the US, <laughs> um, is I think that this tying of territorial sovereignty with the history agenda, I think in, East, in the East China Sea makes it more complex for bilateral management of this problem. And I don't want to say that we have to have a reintroduction or rethinking of the post-war settlement in, the, in East Asia, but I think in Seoul and in Beijing, there's an effort to open up that post-war settlement, and territory now has been attached to it. And I think that's a very important thing for us to stop and talk about a little bit. I don't think it's the right thing for the region, but I think it's something we have to consciously think about here in Washington in terms of our responsibility and our role in navigating those difficult domestic politics. So finally, and I know I have 30 seconds, let me talk a little bit about the U.S. role in Patrick's question. Um, I was there yesterday at Georgetown. I heard Susan Rice uh, speak. Um, I did not sense in that language that there was an equalizing, um, that there's an attempt to equalize the Japan-China position. I think it's very clear in the Obama administration, first and foremost, that Japan is a treaty ally, and there's been very significant and clear statements of that defense commitment under Article 5, and that that covers the Senkaku, so that there should be no miscalculation. Those statements were not meant solely to reassure people in Japan, but they were made to make very, very certain and two secretaries of defense, Gates and, and Panetta, and I suspect Hegel more recently, have reiterated um, that in, in, in Beijing and elsewhere. So I don't sense that there's an equalizing, uh, uh, equalizing thinking going on here. On the other hand, though, I do sense that there's an effort to use a little bit of the logic of our military to military engagement with China to talk about mechanisms, vehicles, opportunities. As you all know, the Mill Mill Dialogue, and some of you here in the room are working on it very, very carefully, is getting some traction between Beijing and Washington. I don't think it's fully developed, but it's beginning to get some traction. And off of that, I think we have an opportunity to have a broader discussion, not only with Beijing, but others in the region about how to <coughs> expand upon that to include other allied powers as well. The other thing that I think the U.S. can bring to this, and I do think it's in the mind of those working on this issue, is the U.S. is is very experienced in risk reduction, right? This is a Cold War experience for us. We have vehicles and mechanisms. China doesn't like the Cold War language, but the mechanisms themselves are of interest. And I think Japan, independently of us, also has venues for exploring with Beijing high-level maritime talks, military civilian conversations on shared interests in the East China Sea. So I don't think our, our positions always have to be exactly the same on this. There's maritime risk reduction that's predominantly focused on the military domain. There's maritime risk reduction that clearly has to be either bilaterally or perhaps multilaterally, regionally pursued, and that we each have a role in that, and those roles, I think, are very complementary. Very, very quickly at the end, I think one of the pieces of the puzzle for the alliance for US and Japan, not for the region, but for us as an alliance, is that our crisis management consultations need to be very, very clear, very, very strong, and very, very thorough. And I expect the US-Japan defense guidelines will have that component in them. They won't exclusively be about maritime issues, but I expect we are in a new threshold for the alliance. It is entirely conceivable that some incident could escalate, and our alliance planning will have to adapt around that scenario. To date, we've, we've planned for Korean contingencies, we've planned, planned for broader regional contingencies, but not a contingency that directly engages Japan first. And so I think the alliance now has a, has a new piece on the agenda of consultations, and that piece needs to be very firmly established, and, and uh, the confidence in the alliance as a mechanism for reducing risk will thereby be enhanced. Thank well, you. Shirley, you've done a brilliant job in the few minutes I've allotted you, and I'm sorry to give you such a short bit of time to talk about these important issues. But part of what you said about the military-to-military -military engagement is a great segue to bring in Vice Admiral Tim Wright, former commander of the U.S. 7th Fleet, who's thought a lot about when navies sort of go bump in the night, and how do you engage, how do you engage each other to try to avoid that and, and try to make these mechanisms um, uh, operational and, and useful? But uh, beyond that, any ideas on risk reduction, Admiral Wright? Thank you, Patrick. I think uh, the morning has been spent that. Uh, as a former naval aviator at the 50,000-foot level, 
I'm going to bring you down to about 10,000 feet maybe and talk a little bit about how the military uh, might think about some of these issues and what things we, uh, we might do both within the military and within the U.S. government to enhance maritime security. And I've got about five or six points which I will go through very quickly. The first one is I really think the United States t needs to develop and publish and be very clear about what our broad-based Asia strategy is. Right now, we don't really, as far as I can tell, have a, uh, either a concept or a document in the U.S. government about what is our real broad-based strategy. There's a lot of talk about such things as the air-sea battle, the pivot to Asia, rebalancing uh, offshore controls. And unfortunately, a lot of people in Asia think that's a strategy. And uh, let me tell you, as a military man, it ain't. Uh, the strategy, I think it's important that the strategy development must have participation and buy-in from all government agencies and particularly key allies. And in Asia, I think that uh, definitely includes Japan. To ensure that we're all singing from the same sheet of music, and it must be broader than just the military imperatives. It will define the anticipated military role but there's an awful lot of things that will hopefully go on before the military gets involved in anything. If we have such a strategy, it will give U.S. senior officials, both as civilian and military, a coherent policy position to support discussions in all of our relationship venues and reduce uncertainty for everyone, including our friends and allies and perhaps adversaries in the region. From a military standpoint, we really need this strategy so that we can understand where we want to go for the basing structure. We don't know where we want to be until we know what we want to do, and so we've got to have that. It will, be, it will drive force level decisions. It will drive weapon, weapon system procurement decisions. All these things must follow from an overarching strategy, and right now we do not have one and haven't had one that I can determine for years. Next area is regional part partnerships, and I think this is key to any success that the U.S. might have in Asia. There is, as I witnessed in, in spades as a 7th Fleet Commander, there's no NATO-like structure in Asia. They're all bilaterals, the occasional multilateral, which we participate in on the edges for, for a large part. So it's very, very important that we work on these partnerships continuously to define a win-win approach so we can define what's in it for all partners. It must be a goal rather than assumption. Uh, years and years ago when uh, uh, the USSR was the main focus of the US military, we made the assumption about where Japan would be in a conflict with the USSR and Russia. I think that was a mistaken assumption in many ways. And it, it, it reduced the impact what what the regional partnerships also do is reduce the impacts of shortfalls in the U.S. Uh, force structure due to resource uh, reduction in, in the Asia. Our, our budgets are going down. I don't see them turning around. We're going to have fewer and fewer forces. We're going to have to work with our partners uh, to enable us to have the deterrence and dissuasion uh, policies and procedures that we need. Following from this, joint multilateral exercises should be pursued whenever possible. Uh, these exercises are critical to hone not only military capabilities and enhance joint operations, but to give us capabilities in humanitarian assistance, piracy, uh, conflict, uh, and, and others. Uh, a classic example right now is the situation in the Philippines with that tor horrible typhoon. Uh, we would be better able to handle that if we had procedures and policies established. Again, uh, reduces the impact of U.S. resource shortfalls. And I, I added a little note to myself at the end. We should include the PRC as much as possible in these joint exercises. And in fact, I believe uh, that China is going to participate in the major RIMPAC exercise next year in Hawaii. And I think that's a great, great step forward. Uh, my next point is uh, one of the, perhaps one of the Cold War mechanisms that Dr. Smith uh, mentioned, and that is the Inc. C agreements that we had with the USSR during the Cold War. And I experienced the firsthand the exercise of those both as a, as a pilot of a fleet defense fighter uh, around the world and then as a uh, ship 
uh, carrier commander in other, in other areas that allows us to provide guidance to the on-scene commander in a situation where you have uh, ships potentially going bump in the night, as Patrick says, and that occurred on more than one occasion. The Inc. Sea Agreement was primarily a U.S. USSR interaction, so it was pretty straightforward and, and quite frankly, very effective. And by the way, it still exists. Uh, there was a recent meeting uh, now, of course, with Russia rather than USSR. Efforts to get to this point in, in Asia included the Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, or the DOC, signed in 2002, but that included only relationships between the PRC and ASEAN nations, did not include U.S., Japan, or the Republic of Korea, which was kind of interesting, some of the major players that might be involved in these kind of things. The uh, discussions that have been mentioned a couple times this morning uh, with regard to the Code of Conduct Currently under discussion, the PRC insists that it be addressed slowly and under the aegis of the DOC. There's still no U.S.-Japan ROC participation likely. So I think that's something that, that the military commanders, particularly the CO of the ship or the pilot in the airplane, need to have some kind of a basis to understand what's going to happen. We really need to, next item is, is uh, sharing of uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. One of the ways that you reduce the possibility of conflict is if you understand what the other party is potentially trying to do. And our ISR partnerships will offset our ability, the U.S. ability, to be everywhere all the time. One of the difficulties of this is the if effective sharing of ISR programs require sharing agreements and policies which are very, very difficult. Nations guard their secrets very carefully. Uh, some suspect that the U.S. has trouble keeping a secret <coughs> from time to time. That has come up. So the solid, uh, the solid intelligence will also reduce the, re the uh, resource shortfalls. And then I'll wrap up very quickly with a couple of, of uh, actually just one real military concern of mine in Asia. One of the critical capabilities uh, that we're going to need to have, particularly in the South China Sea and within the Nine uh, Dash Line in, in, in Asia in general, is the ability to control the commons, as they call it. And we call it sea control. And one of the key factors in that is to be able to handle the submarine problem. I will tell you quite frankly that after the Cold War was over, uh, the United States reduced our emphasis on anti-submarine warfare. And I'm putting that as politely and kindly as I can. And uh, with the number of uh, modern diesel submarines that are being built and bought in Asia, particularly the air independent propulsion models, it is a very, very difficult problem, and if we do get into a situation where we have a conflict, that is going to be one of our shortfalls unless we get on that very quickly. So with that, Patrick, I uh, have no further comments. <laughs> Admiral Wright, that's terrific. A great set of comments, and we're actually back on schedule, and we can turn to our extraordinarily patient um, and intelligent audience and see whether they would like to interject uh, a comment or a question. Um, Otherwise, I'll be turning to, back to the panel, but let me just see if anybody sitting there patiently would like to jump into this whole morning's discussion we've had on reducing risk, whether it was legal or political or other measures to try to reduce or manage this. Yes, sir. Henry. Um, and there's a microphone coming. Henry Bensorto. To reinforce the position. Uh, taken by Dr. Smith in terms of having a menu of choices. I did have, uh, I did discuss extensively the legal, but we're not necessarily limited to that. In fact, we're following, a, um, strictly speaking, a two-track policy, and we have explained this within the SEAN, that the first track is the code of conduct, which is to manage the disputes, actually, in a way, uh, but not to resolve uh, maritime dispute. The legal track is addressed on a more long-term basis, which is to address the maritime dispute. In both cases, we're not trying to address the territorial dispute, but both complement each other and are not necessarily mutually exclusive of each other. They will have their own strengths and weaknesses, but they, you cannot walk on one leg. It's better always to walk with two legs. 
the, the second point is I just want to emphasize that arbitration is not adversarial necessary. It's uh, maybe in that context, but it's not necessarily unfriendly. In fact, there is a United Nations con uh, statement in this regard that arbitration is not an unfriendly act, and therefore it is within the context of a peaceful settlement of disputes. And if in the, re in the context of a realist school, in terms of how you conduct diplomacy, whereby military is a tool of diplomacy, legal track should also be used as a tool in the context of a peaceful way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see Ambassador Rusty Deming uh, over here. Thank, thank you. Very, very rich discussion and so many um, areas to pursue. But just one question for Dr. Lee. How did, how did Beijing react to the Taiwan-Japan Fisheries Agreement? I mean, I can see all sorts of grounds for them to object to, but what, what in fact, how did they react to that? Hmm. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, um, Beijing is not happy about, uh, about the, 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 the way uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan um, dealing with uh, this fishery agreement. But, but I think uh, uh, Japan's position is kind of, uh, I mean Beijing's position is not uh, that relevant in this case. Otherwise, uh, that, will, that will have generated a lot of debates in Taiwan. But uh, you know, your question kind of surprised me. It, it, there, there's n no, no debates uh, about uh, uh, Beijing's position uh, in Taiwan. Dr. Yeah. Yes. Well, one has heard other other stories about pressure and, and subtle pressures from China about uh, whether Taiwan should move ahead on that fishery agreement, which is one of the reasons why it may have been delayed. That is, there was the initial agreement; it caught China by surprise, mm -hmm, yeah. and then that forced Taiwan to slow roll the implementation of the process, maybe to build China's understanding about what you were doing. I don't know. Is, do you want to respond to that? I, I guess uh, the audience uh, know that uh, Taiwanese government's position is there is no uh, cooperation or collaboration with Beijing on maritime security issues here. So uh, I think uh, it, so we, we work separately, independently, and uh, uh, so uh, Taiwan's position will not be affected by uh, Beijing's uh, uh, viewpoints. Yeah. There about the debate inside Taiwan, though, about whether there should be more cooperation across the strait. But the official policy is, as you stated, Dr. Lee, absolutely. Ben Self, do you want to jump in here? Thank you. I, I wanted to kind of put Professor Soya on the spot and ask him to respond to uh, Dr. Smith's notion that managing and putting aside shelving the Senkaku issue rather than resolving it is a long-term uh, effective solution, given the, the kind of race against time in terms of the clash of paradigms you described. That is, can we uh, change China's paradigm before China's relative power growth is such that they can dictate the terms of any resolution? And by simply shelving the issue for another 10 or 15 years, as Ambassador Miyamoto suggested, maybe we're only setting up a situation where China's relative power and China's, uh, what you said maybe middle kingdom concept, gets us to a point where they will impose their will forcefully. I wanted to raise, uh, talk about two other things, but can we do that quickly, including that? Okay. So, so, yeah, and then, We're up, the, and the, we, the, uh, the final words. Uh, but in response to Ben, uh, the question, uh, the reason that I uh, laid out two sort of uh, trends or aspects of the rise of China is because I believe over the long run, this competition between China in the liberal international order and China challenging that order, the former should win. <laughs> and this is, this is a Chinese game inside China. Mm. And uh, so in that context, liberal internationalists of China are terribly important for us to continue to deal with. 
but I know it's a long-term process. And uh, but I think that's the only hope. Uh, I mean, China uh, deciding to continue to live with the liberal international order. I think that will change this context of this paradigm clash. But but uh, I don't know to what extent we can be optimistic. I don't know. A PLA is the key, I think, in the end, anyway. But and the democratization of China is is a big big kind of story. I mean, along this line of you know uh, long term evolution of uh, Chinese you know development. But uh, sorry for a scholarly response. And the two quick points that I wanted to make was uh, Chinese attempts to divide and rule between South China Sea and East China Sea. Uh, I think uh, that should be uh, resisted. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are now the unit and at the time of this rise of China. And uh, f for that matter, I think uh, history question is terribly important for Japan. We, we, we shouldn't give history card to China in doing this. And uh, so it's, it's really a strategic, I think, thing for us, this history question. And the uh, second thing is about the role of US in this. And I think there is three lemma uh, among the following three. One is defending the alliance, which is important for both US and Japan, but managing relations with China, which is also very important. But thirdly, for Japan, this is a question of uh, securing our territorial integrity which is also very important for Japan. And so, so you know, three aspects of defending the alliance, managing relations with China, and the securing our territorial integrity. Priorities could be different between Japan and the US. Uh, but uh, I think that's, that's natural. So how to work on the basis of three lemma? I think it is, is, is it's terribly complex, but I think that's why this is a, a kind of difficult issue, even between Japan and the US. Mm -hmm. James, I don't know if you want to make any final comment, but I mean, one of the um, sort of ideas that I would throw out to you is that it's a, actually a very American, maybe a very North American idea to kind of be a reductionist and to kind of reduce the problems down to sizes that can be uh, managed, when in reality we're talking about actors in a region who are talking about deep history, you know, deep commitments, uh, deep interactions from fishers, fishermen, you know, and fishermen in, in, in areas to, uh, to history. You know, so is there, a, is there a tension between our approaches here, or is this just a, the only practical way to move forward, even though the future is inherently unstable and uncertain? Yeah, that, that, thanks for that easy question. Um, <laughs> there are no good options here. You know, even shelving and kicking it down the road another 20, 30 years for future generations to solve isn't great because we're the future generation that Denzel Ping was referring to, and you know, this generation <laughs> made it worse. <laughs> And there's no sign that the trajectory of sun U.S. relations is getting better. So 50 years down the road, it could conceivably be worse. <coughs> but you know, nothing is predetermined. I'm not as optimistic as Dr. Self is about the trajectory of China's rise. I mean, this is a country that could as easily run into various serious constraints on its ability to, to, uh, to exercise, to apply material power to its foreign policy interests in 10, 15 years, depending on how the country uh, grows economically or, or doesn't. Uh, depending on which school of thought you come from on, on, on China. Um, but at the same time, there's, I, I see no interest in any country in actually sitting down and, and, and negotiating and talking about, uh, about, about the issue to, to solve the, 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 the problem. So I think it does get back to what, what Dr. Smith said about, about, about options. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't envy uh, the U.S. policymaker that has to develop that, that, that menu of options. Uh, I do think there is and I'm, I suppose I'm disappointed in myself for saying this in some ways because I would like to be more innovative. But in some ways, it does just come back to clear statements of, of deterrence and of, of, of where different countries' uh, interests, interests uh, uh, lie and where the red lines are. And that's a problem because in some ways that reinforces a lot of the motivations for, say, China's military spending, right? So you, we are caught in this spiral, but I, I do not see a way out of it, uh, barring the kind of things I mentioned, the outside the box, building empathy between countries, which just is almost impossible to even think of. Um, sorry to end on that tragic well, sad That's note. all right. <laughs> Dr. Lee, do you have any final words you would like to leave with the audience? Oh, okay. Just, um, just want to uh, remind everyone here that a lot of questions raised uh, to me about uh, we, uh, Taiwan and uh, China, share the same uh, claim on, I mean, the territorial claim of South China Sea. Um, I, I just want to emphasize that even we share the same claim, 
but we have different policies of uh, exercising our sovereignty there, and different policies of, uh, of dealing with uh, tensions and uh, conflicts there. For us, we uh, emphasize peaceful uh, measures, peaceful approach. We, just as I said, that uh, uh, there's no military a a a attempts there, uh, no military deterrence uh, approaches there. So I, I think this is uh, uh, need to be clarified a little bit here. Okay, thank you. One China, two policies. I got it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Sheila and, and Tim, do you no, any no, final I'm, words? I'm, All right. Yeah. Well, listen, would you please join me in thanking this uh, excellent panel? Thank you.